it's into his work and his work in progress. Um, so uh, William Waters, my father, has devoted his life to the study of the artist and he and John Christian um, were considered the greatest experts. Um, I'm just going to delete that. There we go. Uh, on, on Burn Jones and the studio output. And the site has been designed by Peter, bearing that in mind. Very sadly, uh, John Christian died. And that has left my father as the leading world expert. He's got big shoes to fill. Um, but the digital project uh, came into being about four years ago. It was Peter Nahum's brainchild. Um, uh, but originally, uh, the notion to make a catalogue resume of the works of Sir Edward Burne Jones was discussed between um, my father and John in as early as the 1970s. And they uh, sort of had a gentleman's agreement that John would write up the major works and that my father would identify sketches, contents of sketchbooks, subsidiary works stained glass works, anything else really. Um, and as it is, um, it's turned out that way because what we include on the site uh, are write-ups from exhibitions, from sale catalogues, uh, many, many expertises by many, many people. But John's career was, whilst his writing was beautifully academic, very, very sound. And wherever we can, we include John's works from his exhibition catalogues, um, from his uh, sale catalogues, his work at Christie's. Um, so actually, his writings are in there and they are documenting the major works. And my father, myself and Peter Nahum are daily documenting and identifying the many, many sketches, sketchbooks, studies, the subsidiary works that come up all the time. And we're working through museum collections pretty much on a daily basis. But as I said, the output was vast. So it's it's not quite an insurmountable task, but it's expanding all the time as we discover new things. Um, as I said, the expertise is we do write them ourselves. Um, we're constantly revising them, but they are mainly gathered from sale catalogues, exhibition catalogues, uh, essays, uh, academic articles, anything that we can find that we feel is worthy, correct and analytic. Um, we also uh, analyse uh, primary texts um, and try and eliminate um, some mistakes that get perpetuated in the, uh, the theory regarding um, Burne Jones. Uh, for instance, when we first started, uh, one of the classic texts is um, Sir Edward Burne Jones, A Record and Review by Sir Malcolm Bell. Um, and you think with subsequent, uh, there, I think there are four or five uh, re printings, runs of that book. And um, we naturally assumed um, that they were very, very similar. They were just up, sort of reprinted. Actually, the editions are different. So when somebody refers to Sir Edward Byrne Jones, a record of review, we have to check which year it was published and go and check that they haven't perpetuated certain mistakes because the, thing, the, the, the text is slightly different and different pieces are illustrated. So we tripped up at first, <laughs> we learned very quickly, and now we're very careful to check which edition is referenced and whether those page numbers and the references are correct. Um, it's the same with um, Fortuné de Lille's early work, um, published in about 1904. She's a wonderful writer and lists um, Burn Jones output to the best of her knowledge, which is very extensive and it's a go to. But again, there are minor confusions and some omissions in that list. So we have to make sure that we're aware of that when these um, texts are referred to in bibliographies. We, we are constantly checking and rechecking because there have been some mistakes that have been perpetuated because people don't have access to the original text and we're very lucky in that my father has collected over 60, 70 years um, 
everything he can lay his hands on to do with Burne Jones. So we have a, an archive with many, many primary sources, um, which gives us a great advantage. And he's gleeful when we do uh, we have to we have to source a primary text, and he's got it. And he says it always makes sense when you've got the original text. And he he thoroughly enjoys the archive in those cases. Um, one of the uh, the other things that, that we are very careful to do is when we do find problems like that that are perpetuated, and there ha there have been several. What we do is we try and pin down where the mistake first happens and then document that so that it's there in the expertise. So if anybody else comes along and they're finding the same confusions, they can see exactly where it started and then it can be eradicated or observed and we can move forward. Um, but the site, as it's gone along and grown, it's become much more than simply a reasoned catalog of the artist's work. Um, as we've gone along, it's ex expanded. And I think really that now it's become more of an encyclopedia of Burne Jones. Um, and obviously it's the nature of digital media that means that this is possible. Uh, we enter everything that we find that has a relevance to the study and understanding of Burne Jones and the man and his art. And most recently, um, we've been examining uh, a scrapbook that belonged to Jane Morris that now re resides in the um, British Museum. It's quite famous for holding lots of Rossetti's lampooning cartoons of Morris, um, but also um, if I go and show you, if I do go to artworks, and this also will give you a little help, hopefully, um, in navigating the site. You'll see this is the first page. I'm just going to scroll down. And rather than enter something into the search here, which you can do, you could type in the Golden Stairs or you could type in any of the major works, what you will find is that you will get lots of the sketches and everything that we've listed and associated with, with that work or those pieces. You can do, there are many different search filters. I won't go into all of them today, but if I select all and scroll down to the bottom, I'm gonna choose provenance as my main selection. And I'm going to, and it'll let me. Oh, it's running a bit slow. There we go. I'm going to type in Jane Morris. Hopefully it'll speed up. There we go. And it's it's given us an offering, and this is the one that we want. So I'm just going to select that and it will throw up everything where Jane is mentioned in the provenance. Now, what we're interested in is this album of 60 caricature drawings. And it's a group entry. So there are lots of, we every page is reproduced. We're very lucky that the British Museum has digitized this um, scrapbook. Um, and you'll see, that there are 52 images, 52 pages. Uh, to, um, I'm just going to, if I can get the screen share to move out of the way, is it going to let me? No, it's not going to let me, so we'll have to do it this way. I plus 52, and I want to move through, is it going to? Just want to move this out of the way if I can. It's not going to let me. Has anyone got any advice about how to move <laughs> the slide panel out of the way? It's it's obstructing where I can access. Uh, Monica, is she there? Um, I I'm not quite sure with yeah. it's. We're, we're I'm not, not quite sure what you're seeing on your end. See, we're not seeing the Zoom controls. You're fine. Yeah. 
Is it possible for you to minimize your um, browser screen to be smaller? Um, oh, I could perhaps and then... do that. Could I do that maybe? No, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move, at, I wonder if I do that maybe, no? That's better. Okay. You can also you can all still see my screen, can't you? Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to scroll through the fifty-two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you, you might recognize. You might, um, what we have in this sketchbook um, is a flyer for the Earthly Paradise, um, and this was produced uh, to advertise the projected publication of the. William Morris, the, William Morris is the Earthly Paradise. And it's very interesting because there are lots of things marked and there are things listed on this flyer that didn't actually appear in the published Earthly Paradise. So it, it's annotated presumably by William, but it's also graffitied on by a certain Mr. Burne Jones. And here we have William Morris posed as the classical bard in an alcove and then he's also leaning on a pillar here um and so we've got we've once again we have we have a a, a and sort of we're, we're allowed to see this wonderful sort of gentle jokey friendship that, that that existed between the two and just here you've got it looks like a, a kneeling figure um with a, a rather <laughs> a grotesque bottom over the feet there but it's absolutely delightful. But Jane held on to this and it's pasted in her, her scrapbook, which is which is wonderful. Um, and it's 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 significant to us because it's Burne Jones making these wonderful comic caricatures. Um, also pasted into this scrapbook. I'm just going to scroll through quite quickly. We have. I'm just going to click on this one here. An article, it's a number of pasted, pasted in. Uh, it's from Temple Bar magazine and dates from 1869. And it's called The Poetry of the Period. And it's a review of the poetry of Matthew Arnold and Mr. Morris. And this is, it's, it's Morris's copy that he's kept or torn out of the magazine. And obviously he and Byrne Jones have discussed this article and Byrne Jones has doodled throughout it with these delightful little caricatures. So you can see there's William Morris and here is Matthew Arnold. Um, and when we discovered this, we, know, we went through it and lots of the pages have wonderful caricatures on there's another plain one very interesting article but let's see if i can find it. oh i just missed it there we go you can see <laughs> there are these wonderful little caricatures of morris and over consumption of wine uh the great bard wine and vine throughout um, and this this was an absolute delightful because my father, neither myself nor my father had come across this. Um, and in works on Burn Jones as a humorist, these hadn't appeared, these little cartoons and these annotations on this article reviewing Morris's poetry. Um, and they're all on the, the British Museum website. But I noticed that on the British Museum website, a page was missing, page 47 was missing. So uh, we're very lucky in that Peter does love, live in London and we asked him if he could uh, contact the British Museum and go in and see if we could photograph uh, the missing page 47. I mean, I it was a long shot um, and I wasn't sure whether there was actually gonna be a cartoon on it. But if I get to the end, here's page 47. And lo and behold, we have another wonderfully humorous cartoon of William Morris. And it says, uh, he feels that he has wings. And Ben Jones has, has drawn this little caricature of a chubby Ben Morris with um, 
cherub's wings. So we're finding these li little sort of gems all the time. Um, and they're often often overlooked. But, but we have what we're finding is that um, the more research we do into Burne Jones's sketchbooks, the more we learn about him, but also we come up against the problem in England is that British museums are, are seriously underfunded and their digitization programs um, are it's sort of almost non-existent. You'll go to, for instance, the William Morris Gallery and you'll search for things and it's listed and it gives you an accession number, but there's no image. And with this massive output by Burne Jones, you have lots and lots of drawings and sketches that very often have the same title, relate to the same thing. They've got different accession numbers, or they may even have similar provenances, but without an image. You can't distinguish them and you can't analyze what contribution they've made. So what we have to do is we have to personally go to these museums and photograph and document these things. We've got a wonderful working relationship with the Victoria and Albert Museum. They are wonderfully cooperative with us, as are the National Trust. And Peter was able to go to Whittick Manor and photograph uh, the sketchbooks that they have, and they were a mine of information. They hadn't been digitized um, and their contents hadn't really been analyzed um, in depth. And we do this quite happily and gleefully because they're so informative. Um, but we analyze right expertise as we date them. We give as much information as we possibly can and it's all for free. So the National Trust and the v &A can access this information. Um, I wonder if I can stop screen sharing now so you can see me <laughs> while I'm talking. Um, and what we're finding is that um, the more we delve into these sketchbooks, the more we know logically. Um, I don't think there's been as much work done on analysing the contents of the sketchbooks um, since uh, Kurt Locher analysed um, the work of the, the, the that was connected to the Perseus series as a publication. I don't know if you might not be familiar with this. This was published in 1973. And Kurt Locker, it was really good in that he really dug around amongst these sketchbooks and reproduces a lot of the, uh, the, the preliminary works that allowed us to see how Burne Jones developed the Perseus series. Um, but as I said, and let you, the, the sketchbooks are very delicate, so you can't have streams and streams of people going and looking at them all the time. So digitization is a much, much safer way of allowing us and the world and all of the scholars and all interested people to see the, their contents and make contributions and analyze them. But it's, it's one of those things, it's a funding thing. And ebj.org, Peter is, the brain, the brains and the finance behind it at the moment, but we are cap in hand and, and any there is a donation button that you can make on the site, but it's it's really for funding those kind of projects to getting someone to go and stay in Cambridge and work um, at the Fitzwilliam digitizing their collections for us because what they've digitized is incomplete um, and they struggle to find the funding themselves to be able to do that and open up their collections to us. Um, the site is, is built to encompass all that Burne Jones was involved in and to incorporate ever increasing uh, and developing scholarship. And we do welcome submissions and are very happy to give opinions on works. We've got a very healthy working relationship with lots of auction houses in the UK. And we're very often credited uh, when we advise and um, because you get some really curious things coming up for auction and it's it's lovely to be able to ally them with the with the work that they should be allied with and identified correctly because there is a lot of misunderstanding um, about dating Burne Jones drawings uh, be just because a Burne Jones drawing is of a subject doesn't mean it's from a specific 
a specific painting. Very often, Ben Jones is working on similar subjects for many, many years. Um, the Cupid and Psyche series is, is a case in point. There are drawings made that the, the, the girls in them are very stylistically 1860s, but then he was also working on images for the Cupid and Psyche series much, much later in his career. And we have a late painting, The Marriage of Psyche, which was done in the 1890s. And he completely revised the um, figurative type and we have drawings for that too. And there's a, but people tend to date them, the 1890s versions as 1860s because that was when he was working on Cupid and Psyche. So we're trying to eliminate that kind of confusion. Um, my father and I tend to make worse, make worse, make worse, work most days um, and there's always something, there's always, there's always something um, occurring to us um, and we try and go in and amend. Um, obviously now after working on the project for four years, our exposure to Burn Jones Deserve is quite, is quite um, exceptional and we're able to make all sorts of connections between works that previously possibly haven't been made. The scholarship hasn't um, sort of spotted these things, if you like. Um, you, one of the joyful things about the site is you can search by date. So you could say you could search from you could search from 1860 through to 1864. You could search from 1870 to 1875, and you'll see all the projects that Burne Jones is working on contemporaneously. And when you do this, you do start seeing relationships between works that you wouldn't necessarily think were there. Um, something that occurred to me um, not so long ago when we were working on the Perseus series, uh, the, the fallen body of Medusa. Um, ben Jones comes up with a device where he, he has the fallen Medusa, he paints her from behind so that you don't see the head that's removed, you don't see the gore of the neck. Um, and at the sim a similar time, he was working on Cupid's hunting fields and we have Cupid standing on a fallen figure below him um, and it's Medusa almost exactly reversed. Um, but also, it's very interesting that he's working on a subject, Perseus is, crashing into Medusa's life and he beheads her in his quest um, and he de completely destroys her status quo uh, and it's it's almost like he's saying Cupid is doing the same for young people and and the love in people's lives Cupid crashes into people's lives he's Cupid the destroyer almost and there's a there's a uh, a sort of a, a little insight into his psychology because we know the affair with Maria Zambarco that he had had devastating results at, um, upon him as well as um, uh, you know, sort of wonderfully stimulating um, results. It was how do you resolve a love affair when you're when you're married and with small children um, and he constantly tries to analyze it and work it through in his artwork and, and my father and I both thought that this this little sort of flip of the figure of Medusa into Cupid Hunt Huntingsfield was, ra was rather revealing. The, the other thing that we have uh, recently published on the site is uh, an article about the artist studio which it causes a great deal of contention and is a fascinating subject with Burn Jones because he had so many studio assistants and considered anything that he signed off and left his studio as being by him. But we see the hands of studio assistants in unfinished works. So there's an article sort of going into the layers of studio work that you find with um, the, the oeuvre of Burn Jones. Um, currently, we have 11,000 works on the site, many thousand more images accompanying those, and it's growing daily. When we do find duplicates, as inevitably that does happen, uh, we merge them, um, but it's, it's one of those ongoing things when you have a, um, these sort of different analysis and you'll find things from through different avenues, very often you do get a duplication, but the merging process is relatively simple uh, and we do do it as soon as we spot them. Um, there, all the books that we know of 
relating to Burne Jones and that mention him and the articles that are in the, the bibliography section. And you can search that under title or author. There are nearly two and a half thousand, maybe 2,600 works listed now, um, as are all the exhibitions, which you can also search by. Um, the works that he's been, that have um, had works by Burne Jones uh, included, um, there are nearly 820 so far, and we continue to find them. And we list as new exhibitions come along, um, we, we enter them as soon as we can, along with the catalogue references and page numbers. The site is, is beginning to raise in profile. Um, we got some analysis from the administrators uh, for this talk. Currently, we get over 1,100 hits per month, of which 88% are new users. And this is actually to be expected because the larger we grow, the more we become a vehicle that Google pushes forward and it, we become a stronger presence so a for interested parties, for researchers, um, and anybody who sort of hits Burn Jones in, into the web, hopefully we come up and we, and we provide um, useful information. As I said earlier on, it's a matter of principle that the site is free to use. Um, we're very, very keen that our work is accessible to all, or everyone who's got, a, who's got access to the web and the digital world. Um, if a catalogue resume was to be made hard copy, it would be vast um, and com completely unaffordable, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it would and it would be a finite piece. Whereas the digital um, catalogue resume allows us to go on and grow. And one of the discussions that we had at the last trustees meeting was how to make the site future proof. And there were discussions about a forum for discussions. Um, concerning subjects to do with burn Jones and, and off burn Jones. And that's, I think that possibly is something that we may um, introduce, but it may, it may be a few years ahead of us yet, but it's certainly something that we want to encourage. We want to discourage the discussion of his art and research and all sorts of things annexed to burn Jones studies. And we'd love to be at the center of it. Um, Another little note is we have a section called inauthentic, and this sounds terribly damning, um, and it isn't meant to be. We do, um, it's not just about outing the fakes that are there, although we have um, my de there are the, in, famously in the 1990s there was what we call the the red chalk faker, who is a brilliant Burne Jones faker. He produced the most amazing red chalk drawings that are almost indistinguishable, but they had no provenance. And so you have to be very careful with red chalk drawings that only kind of appear on the market in the 1990s. <laughs> um, so those, when we know those, when we have those definitively, we do, we do identify them. But as I said, there's a lot of confusion with Burne Jones drawings, even in major collections. So we have Strudwick's um, listed as Burne Jones. We have Spencer Stanup drawings listed as being by Burne Jones. There are some drawings um, in the v &A that look very like Siddles. They're not Burne Jones, but they're identified as Burne Jones. And this is something that presumably the people who donated and bequested these works to these big collections were told or felt that these were works by Burne Jones. So there are mistakes there. We try and um, correct these and inform the relevant parties when we find things like this. Um, but we put what we do is we identify them as we think correctly and then put them into inauthentic so that it's it's quite public. Um, and so we do we really, really try to re-identify pieces if we don't think they're by Burne Jones. And sometimes it's it's quite obvious they're not by Burne Jones. But it's a very interesting field. Um, and it really makes you feel like you work more work needs to be done on 
John Melvish Strudwick, on Spencer Stanner, on Marie, the works of Marie Stillman, to, because they are brilliant artists too, but very often they are confused with Byrne Jones. Um, Peter wanted me to say that the website is transferable and anyone could use the mechanism um, for a, a catalogue resume of their own or a gallery website. It's just really contact Peter at the Leicester Galleries. Um, uh, elements can be hidden um, and there's also it can be it can be manipulated um, to, to suit anyone's needs. But it is sort of it. It's a, it, it is definitely a work in progress. And it, I mean, that, and with developing the site and it, uh, um, amending it and changing it to try and make it more effective, easy to use and to service the the oeuvre that, that, we're, that we're dealing with so that it's more effective and people can have more fun with it and, and have a more effective searches. Um, and basically that's a general overview. I don't, I don't want to go on too further because I'm wondering if people have questions, but thank you very much for listening. It's a real honor to be able to speak to you at this meeting. Um, and I do, I do hope that you go along to the site and have a little explore um, and see which rabbit holes it takes you down because there are all sorts of fascinating bits and pieces on there. Um, we're constantly identifying new pieces um, and it's great fun. Every day we discover something new about Burn Jones and it becomes more and more interesting. Thank you very much. While others are thinking questions, uh, let me ask you a very on Mauritian question, and that is, uh, how are you funded? Uh, it may, it's independently through Pete and Ahum. Okay. Um, we do uh, auction it when people do want us to identify pieces. We do uh, make a small charge of one hundred and eighty pounds, but that that's not something that we can call. Um, sort of rely on it doesn't generate a lot of income we don't we they don't identifications don't come in daily mm -hmm. it's it's a relatively small revenue that's generated that way um and we, we are a charity okay. so we're, we're non-profit making okay i think i saw margaret with a question margaret No, that was just applause. Okay, I see. <laughs> uh, any questions for Sarah? I did put a, her, her link in the chat, by the way. Yes. If anything occurs to you at a later date, I know it's always, it's, I can never think of questions after these kinds of things. And then something will occur to me later on. If you do, just send um, just send it through. You can, um, very kind of you do to put my contact, you know, for contact details there. Um, just email it through. Right. Um, and we will absolutely endeavor to answer as much as we can. Right. I have a question for you through uh, Florence, and that is, uh, <clears throat> Florence, uh, can you talk anything about the um, anything about the earthly paradise? Were you aware of that uh, that bit that she mentioned? No, I was not, and I was delighted. And I intend for us today to try to access it. I am the editor of the William Morris Archive, and we collect everything about William Morris. Usually, not quite as much visual as um, textual, but obviously that wonderful um, draft with the Morris X's, I mean, they are Morris's X's, you can tell from the handwriting. And then those caricatures is a really important thing and I appreciated you bringing that to our attention. I'm thinking we can link it. I was also quite impressed by the search capacities of your site because that is a very hard thing to get right. And of course, it's the most important thing. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, as we've gone along, what we found as, as the site has got bigger, um, what we find it with, because my father's not tech at all. So it's really good to have a, an un, a very untechy person using the site on a daily basis. Um, we found that actually, you know, just typing something into the search at the top 
bring is is too broad so if you can use one of the filters down the side provenance um exhibition collection or date it really narrows it down so that you're not trolling through pages and pages and pages and it gets you faster to where you want to go so if you can qualify it with one of the subcategories down the side that really makes it much more effective and i use that much more now than I did when I began. But yes, that Earthly Paradise flyer was a revelation. <laughs> and, and you know, sort of the fact that it has things in it that didn't subsequently appear, um, it, it's, it's a delightful thing. <laughs> Especially because there's lampooning going on. You can just imagine, um, Burn Jones giggle chortling away, making these caricatures of Morris throughout an article that's <laughs> reviewing his poetry as well, can't you? But the fact that Jane kept it and pasted it into the same sketchbook as she has Rossetti's cartoons of her husband and several other things, it's it's really, really, really interesting. <laughs> Did I see something in the chat? A question. It was just someone <laughs> reacting to the I I I, I reposted the website. Yeah. So for those oh, of someone asked, Robert Del Camp asked, you mentioned misinformation passed down through the years. Can you give us an example of this? Oh, oh heavens. Um that's a that's a difficult one. Uh specifics. Um, the Briar Rose series, several series, um, it's a very difficult one-to-one -one pick. Um, John Christian does a wonderful analysis and he really got to the bottom of it. But because um, you're dealing with paintings that have the same title, uh, you get confusion, so people will refer will refer to one painting thinking that there's only one version, and actually there are two or possibly three, and you'll get a confusion about those those paintings because they're unaware. Malcolm Malcolm Bell um, has has done does this uh, a couple of times, and you and it really throws you on a, a googly. Because you're 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 thinking about one thing, he's he's thinking about another, and you you have to get right underneath the skin of the writer to see what they're referring to. Um, it, it's I, I can have I can go and have a, have a look, and I, I can I can certainly ask my father as well to find a specific. But it's it's it is that where you get. Um, the uh, two versions of the same painting same subject um uh, that that often throws people a loop um uh, there's also uh something that happened recently uh a drawing that belonged to francis horner that was uh exhibited at the burlington exhibition in 1899 and the lay, the, there are wonderful labels on the back of it. We're very lucky in that the auction house um, photographed the back of the picture and the, the labels are on there. The backs of pictures are very often just as interesting as the front. And there's the label with the Burlington exhibition, it's still pretty much intact. And you can make out that it was lent by Francis Horner. Um, and then there's this label 54 underneath and the auction house assumed that that was the exhibition number um, and had written it up as such that it was in the exhibited in the Burlington as uh, number 54, catalogue number 54. Um, and we, when they came to our site, because we'd written up the drawing previously, it was a known drawing, um, they questioned us and said, but it's Burlington catalogued at 54, you say it's catalogued 63. And so um, we thought that was very strange. We thought, you know, was it a typo? You know, typo? Had we made a mistake? So we're very lucky in that my father has a copy of the Burlington catalogue. So we went back, checked, 
And no, we were correct. It's there in black and white. It was catalog 50, 63. And that the, 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 the 54 label on the back relates to an earlier exhibition. Um, and it's that that kind of thing, it ha it's happening now, but it also ha it's, it's happened in the past and people have written things up. Um, and you do you do get exhibition catalogues where the the, um, the typing up you can they very often you get typos and it's 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 a catalog reference or it's a page number but it can throw it can really throw you off and you can get terrible terrible um, sort of confusions be, through these typos. And because we're very lucky that we do have the texts, we go back and look, and then we point it out. <laughs> we're very pedantic like that. But you do, you really do have to get to the bottom of it. Otherwise, it, you can look like you're, you're wrong in so many effects. And actually, it's a typo um, or, or a misunderstanding. I think Florence has a question on software. <laughs> Which what do you use for the platform? Uh, it's it's a it's um, worked through a company called Blue Fling, Flamingo, um, and I think I think it, it, it at the bottom of the side I think it's a gallery something. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not the the best tech person in the world, but the gentleman who we who we deal with and who um, helps us uh, co-design the site is called Tim Husband. And he's he's very knowledgeable. Um, obviously, we're only as good as our search algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, what we found is as we've gone along, um, we've amended the way we enter thing the titles of things. Um, if we have a sketch, say of uh, Thisbe, and it relates to the legend of good women. Um, but it's for the embroidery rather than the stained glass design. We will make that distinction, but we will say this be for the legend of good women embroidery design. So that if you did a search embroideries, it would come up. If you didn't put that, you would get this be in the stained glass design of all of the thisbies. So we try and make the search engine look for things to help you find things more easily. Uh, we also enter both names of things. Uh, Burne Jones is very clever in that very often his paintings have several names, like the car of love is also known as love's wayfaring. So whenever anything relates to the car of love, we also put love's wayfaring in so that both searches will find it. Um, it's that, again, that is an ongoing process and that develops as we go along. Pamela put a note in the chat that says galleries online. Thank you. Jan has a question. Does the web catalog indicate, uh, hold on Jan, I just lost it here. Does the web catalog indicate current location of works? Are there collections in the US where a group of Burne Jones work can be viewed? Uh, um, well, we, uh, in the provenance, we, provenance as, as you know, are absolutely crucial. And we are put in as much provenance as we know. And a lot of the time we we are actually putting the provenances in because we're tracing them through the primary sources. Um, and we, we, we follow through uh, exhibition catalogues, through sale catalogues, through people's diaries and writings and comments. Um, many, many sort of biographies of, for instance, um, Time Wars by Edward, uh, I think it's Edward Clifford, uh, is, is wonderful because he talks about the paintings. William Grant Robertson's um, uh, uh, sort of diary and sort of reminiscences are crucial because he talks about where paintings are and who owns them. So we've, we are at pains to get the provenances as full as possible. So if you go into a work, and we, we know where it is, we will trace it as far back as we can and we'll tell you where it currently is. If a painting's whereabouts is unknown, we will put that in the expertise. So we, we do 
we are at pains to let you know where things are, where we do. <laughs> but there are many, many paintings untraced. Um, we know about paintings that are lost. There was a, f a fire um, in the Second World War and we, lo we lost a few paintings there and, and that's documented. We're very lucky in that we have um, some images of them so that we know what they looked like so we can work out the studies that relate to them. Um, but there, there is um, a famous painting called The Boat, which is missing. We have one photograph of it at um, a turn of the century exhibition. Um, and Pete has been very clever in that he's managed to make it as high res as possible and blow it out. Um, so that we've got this very sort of fuzzy image of the boat, but we kind of can see what it was like. Um, we don't know where that is. But what's also delightful about that painting is that it was glazed. And we've got this shadowy reflection of Frederick Hollier taking the photograph of, the, of that wall. So it's multi-layered. It's fascinating. That, that image that we have of it is fascinating because we have Hollier documenting. Of course, he's the famous photographer who documented so much. But we've got him in the picture, which is lovely. Good. So, yeah, there are two avenues. In the provenance uh, listings and in the expertise, we will give you where we can where it has been and who it belongs to now. Are there particular restoration studios that specialize in Vern Jones's work? That's from, oh, Jan, from Jan. Yeah, that, that's, a that's a very interesting question. Um, to be honest, I, I don't know. Peter Nahum would be the person to ask, ask pose that question to, as he um, has had many Burn Joneses pass through his hands and owned several himself. He would be the person to talk to about that. Um, uh, and, and, and there's, I, don't, I don't know if you know this story, but during Burn Jones's lifetime, um, he he was he worked very densely in watercolours, and people couldn't tell the difference between his watercolours and his oils. And the, one, the first version of Love Among the Ruins is a watercolour and he sent it for exhibition in Paris and they were going to have it photographed and they decided that it needed a bit of a wipe over so they took a damp cloth to it and ruined yeah. it. <laughs> Can you believe it? Oh. And there are letters, Burn Jones is absolutely horrified you can believe can't you he was horrified couldn't believe the ignorance and there are letters going on about doesn't will the insurance cover it but that doesn't that doesn't matter my work's been destroyed um and he did he, he had it back and they had to repaint it right <laughs> so it, the, the restoration and the any of anybody other than burn jones in the studio touching his works enter at your peril i would say <laughs> Uh, other questions? The last question for Sarah? If not, Sarah, thank you very much for your splendid presentation. It, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's lo lovely to, to see you all. You. And uh, as I yes. say, I'm very, very happy to answer any further questions as they occur to good, you. Good, thank you. And you can stay on if you wish to, um, to listen to the rest of the uh, meeting. But uh, again, thank you very much. Oh, I'd, asked... I'd love to. Okay, lovely. I've asked a number of folks to give some reports and announcements. And um, I'm going to call on uh, Imogen if she wants to give the Dunlap and the Student Award. If not, Imogen, I have it in front of me. Thanks, Jude. I can give the um, Student Award announcement. And then I'll hand over to you to do the Dunlap. Okay, that's good. Okay? Good. Um, yeah, so we introduced, as the society, we introduced a new student award last year. Um, two awards, one for an, a piece of writing and one for a, an artwork. And so we were very pleased to award both of those prizes. Um, I'll put the text of the winners in the chat so that you can see 
um, more about their work, but the name of the uh, the winner of the essay prize was Mary Schreiner from University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and the winner of the art project prize was Emory Morris of Virginia Commonwealth University. So huge congratulations to both winners, and um, please tell your students if you work with students to apply for the prize this year. The announcement is out on the website, and we very much welcome submissions. I'm just putting the information about the. Uh, the winners in the chat for you to look at um, find out more about it over to you jude thank you uh the dunlap award is from um is named after joseph dunlap who is our founder his family is our largest donor given the funds for the fellowship annually uh, mr dunlap's son andrew is an active member of the society and i looked around on the site to see if he was at, at the, today's meeting and i didn't see him so if he's there he can um, put his hand up or something. But thanks to the Dunlap family for their continued support and contribution to the future of Morris Studies. The uh, Dunlap Memorial Fellowship Award goes to Dr. Lindsay Wells, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. Uh, the Dunlap Fellowship will support Dr. Wells as she undertakes research for her book project, Evergreen Empire, Plants, Power, and Race in Peripheralite and Aesthetic Art. Her research will take her to two of the largest archives of 19th century British nursery catalogs in the United States, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society Library in Wellesley and the L.H. Bailey Ornatorium Catalog Collection at Cornell, where she will analyze alongside Morris's wallpaper, textiles, and stained glass designs. This, investigates, this investigation will con contribute to her discussion of how Morris and his contemporaries responded to the influx of new flowers from abroad during the 19th century, and how Morris in particular contributed to debates in the Victorian art world about whether or not um, foreign plants merited a place in British visual culture. Uh, we are all looking forward to this, um, this, this discovery. I'm fascinated by it. Um, having spent so much time at Kew uh, and uh, walking around the grounds to see all of the things that were stolen from everywhere and brought back into London, um, imperialist flowers, I guess um, Jamaica Kincaid calls it flowers of evil. So I'm looking forward to seeing what, um, what uh, Dr. Wells has uh, uncovered. Uh, the William Morris Society Award is, uh, goes to Dr. Stephanie John, who is a lecturer and postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of English and American Studies in Germany. The prize will support Dr. John as she undertakes a UK study trip as part of a book project, Decorative Materialities, Textile Objects in British Literature and the Fin de Siècle. Her research will focus on Morris's verses for pictures and from poems, by the way which were used on tapestries and embroideries and revolve around nature-inspired themes. And she will visit the British Library to view editions of Poems by the Way and the Victorian and Albert Museum and the William Morris Gallery to study tapestries, which, use, which Morris uses interplays with verses for pictures. So congratulations to Dr. Wells and also to Dr. John, and thanks again to the um, generosity of the Dunlap family for the continuing research that, um, that can support the society, but support academic research um, broadly. So thank you very much. Um, I asked um, Brandy Ann and Annie to talk very, uh, Anna rather, very quickly about Useful and Beautiful, an update. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so this uh, soon to be hitting your mailboxes will be the second issue of Useful and Beautiful that Brandy and Mulby and I have edited. Um, and I'm biased, but it's great. There's a lot of interviews with folks, many of whom are on the Zoom call um, as well. We're always looking for uh, submissions from folks. We're also thinking more about doing um, thematic issues and playing around with the format a bit um, as well. So hopefully one on textiles coming up soon. Um, I'll also point you to the Words with William feature that we started last issue where we include a quote from William Morris, but probably soon other members of the Morris family and ask folks to respond to that. So we'd love to make that feel like a community kind of 
um, focused feature. And um, you can always email the Morris Society Gmail account if you have thoughts about um, something you might like to submit. I'm also going to put mine and Brandy's emails in the chat as well, so you can contact us directly. Um, huge thank you to Florence Booz for continuing to help with uh, printing and mailing and, and that structure, um, as well as to Carla Tonella, who's um, continuing to do a really great job with our graphic design. Um, so yeah, that's it for UNB. Um, keep an eye out for it soon. Thanks, and I folks. should say that Useful and Beautiful can be found on the Morris Society website. So under, if you go into the website uh, and click on publications and scroll down, you will see um, the current issues of, current and past issues of Useful and Beautiful. Yep. Um, CAA, Imogen, Tracy, and I want Mark to talk a little bit about the Grolia. Hi again. Um, so the William Morris Society in the United States has for the last few years been an affiliated society of CAA which means that we have an annual panel at that conference. And so the latest panel that we organized um, was chaired by Monica Bowen, who is a member of our board. Um, and I've put the link in the chat so you can find out more about it if you're interested. And it was on the subject, rethinking craft, colonialism, post-colonialism, decolonization. Um, if you um, are interested in, um, participating in our future panels. Um, stay tuned because we are thinking ahead to next year and we hope soon to be um, finding out this summer, I think, um, what the topic of our panel next year will be. Um, and we'll share information about that in due course. Um, and I'll pass over to Mark to talk about the event that we had in New York. You're Mark, muted, Mark. Yeah, Mark, you're muted. Okay, lovely. On February uh, 17th, a group of Morris Society members and guests um, visited the Grolier Club in New York, uh, the country's oldest uh, book collecting society. Um, we were given a tour of the library uh, by the librarian Jamie Crumbie and the assistant librarian Scott Elwood, who brought out some Morris related items. Uh, and these were really remarkable books from William Morris's library, Kelmscott Press books, including one that he presented to the Grolier Club in 1894, proofs for the Kelmscott Press, uh, and items relating to the revival of the digital uh, golden type in the 1990s. Uh, following the library visit, uh, members of the Grolier Club and people from the number of the fabs uh, Society has joined us for a drinks party. And that was a quite a successful event um, tied to the CAA meeting in New York. And we are hoping to have some more in-person events starting in the fall. One of the things that, thanks Mark and Imogen, one of the things that fascinated me when I was at the um, Grolia is uh, which Mark reminded me, it's the Daniel Press and the Garland of Rachel. And Mark, you should be happy to know that my copy arrived yesterday. So here it is. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating read and I can hardly wait to break into it, um, especially the poems by Bridges and, um, and, uh, and Lewis Carroll. I'm fascinated by those along with the other poems. So thanks again to Mark for uh, making me aware of it and for the Grolia Library for showing us the copy that they had uh, on display. Um, a bit on MLA, uh, the Modern Language Association meets um, every January. This last January, it was in San Francisco and uh, Florence and I and a few others um, met uh, with Peter Stansky at his house to look at his collection of pre-Raphaelite work and then my son in Hillsborough, not too far from Peter's uh, place, had a reception for us, a dinner for us. So we left uh, Peter's place and went to Jeremy's place for dinner and had a delightful time at, at MLA. Uh, MLA 2024 is going to be in Philadelphia. And uh, I'm hoping that we can have um, Mickey, I'll put the, the, the pressure on Mark to uh, have a reception for us uh, at some gallery or library 
or, or society. I know the American Philosophical Society is there. I'm, I'm a member of them, so we'll see what can happen. But if you are in the Philadelphia, the greater Philadelphia area, uh, we'd love to see you. Um, uh, we are going to make these, this information available to you on the website. So you are more than welcome to join us for any of these tours, reception events uh, as we move around. I believe CAA is in Chicago next year. So I am sure there's going to be some Chicago events. So those of you who are in the greater Chicago area, by all means, uh, plan to, to meet us for dinner, reception, for drinks or what have you uh, while we do these, uh, these tours. Um, Adrian, I believe, has, if not, I have the report. Adrian, are you there on Morris in Iceland? I don't hear anything from Adrian. Uh, there is a scheduled Morris in, in, in Iceland tour. Um, and, and I just heard from um, Martin, who is the organizer, uh, the trip is from the 23rd of July to the 1st of August. Uh, we thought that it was sold out. Adrian assured us that we can still take applicants. Uh, the price is £3,500, which he says is incidentally half the price of another trip I know about for Australians being led by my friend and neighbor. So uh, they're, still, uh, they're still short of 13 participants. It's a Morris tour focusing on Morris and Iceland, and it's from the 23rd of July uh, to the 1st of August. I believe the information, if it's not, we will make sure that it's on the website, on the Morris Society website. So uh, you can look there for the information on the Iceland, on the Iceland tour. Um, Imogen, can you come back again and talk a little bit about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and some of the programs we have upcoming? Sure. Yes, so our society has a committee devoted to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And we have um, a page on our website just summarizing some of the um, aims and initiatives of this committee, which I'm posting in the chat here. Um, I'll just highlight a few of those. One of the things we've done is to introduce a free digital membership for students in order to make our resources more accessible um, and to support students who are interested in being part of our community. Um, and we're also um, working hard to make sure that all of our recorded events have captions when we um, post them, um, post the recordings to make those as accessible as possible. Um, and we're developing further initiatives, which will um, advertise as they um, as they take shape. Um, and we very much welcome suggestions from anyone in our society about ways that we can improve diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you. Imogen, can you say just uh, just give them a sort of wet the appetite about a possible diversity award? Yeah. So we're. Um, We'd like to, we, 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 we've just introduced the student award and now we would like to introduce another award, which is going to be um, focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion and access. Um, therefore, um, rewarding and supporting and encouraging and promoting um, any kind of work that contributes to those um, to those values of the society. Um, and so we are, we are um, finalizing the announcement for that award now and um, we really hope that if you have any ideas for people who might be nominated for the award that you um, keep those in mind and share them with us when the award um, is announced. And the announcement again will be up on the website so it's the it's the go-to place for everything Morris. Thanks Imogen. Um, David and Adrian, uh, membership and board membership recruitment. You may even want to talk about new board members and recruitment. Let me, uh, hi there. Um, we have a board composed currently of about 15 folks. Uh, it's divided into three classes. Everyone serves three, one three-year term and then they're eligible for another three-year term and then they rotate off. Uh, we are looking to uh, see if anyone on this call or anyone that you might know of 
uh, who is uh, active in Morris Matters would be interested in joining our board. We attempt to keep a balance between the polymath Morris's many uh, talents uh, as having representatives on the board from book arts to textile arts to literature to politics. So uh, keep us in mind if you're interested in uh, rolling up your sleeves and getting a little more active. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I asked Monica uh, to give a, a report on activities this past year, and she sent it off to me. So I think she's at a public place and therefore can't weigh in, even though I saw her on site a few minutes ago. Uh, so here it is. In uh, September of 2022, we had the Kem Scott at the U, U of M Special Collection Research Center, U of M as in the University of Michigan, and a delightful presentation from the U of M on the Kem Scott especially to me, the Kemp Scott Chaucer, but the entire collection in the rare book room uh, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. Uh, in October, we had Graceful Radiance and Cabinet Curiosity, Glass from the American Arts and Crafts Movement. Uh, in November, we had a visit with Peter Stansky, William Morris and me, and uh, during our, our trip to San Francisco this last January, I got to see a lot of his collection, which derived the, the source of his talk on William Morris and me. In uh, this past January, we had Althea McNish, Color is Mine, and it's called Meet the Curators. And that again was, uh, a, was a fabulous one. And then the most recent one, which I happened to be teaching at the time and Imogen said, well, why don't you have your class look in on it? And I did. So I had my class, uh, part of that, um, that presentation on that day, uh, a book event, new books on 19th century interiors that was in February, uh, 2023. Um, so that's what we have. We have a number of exciting um, events coming up. Again, look to the website for those events. Uh, they are all free, so be, be sure to sign up, encourage friends to sign up, um, and again, uh, participate as much as you can in some of the events and, and activities uh, that we have. Um, I don't have anything else, so other questions that you might have or other business? Any questions on anything mentioned that you would like some clarity on or more information on? If not, uh, hearing nothing, our monthly board meetings, uh, the second Tuesday of every month, uh, where we take up any number of these things uh, and activities of the society. So feel free to write to us, um, email us, um, join us, uh, support us, fund us, Sarah, fund us. Um, Sarah is striving with, um, Thackeray has a lovely thing in Vanity Fair, I guess, uh, how to live well on nothing a year. It's a lovely chapter. And so uh, Sarah's society and our society and society like ours are living well on nothing a year. So um, put us in your will um, and, and any way you can support us would be really, really appreciated. I don't know if anyone has a final word. I see Jane. Jane, it's lovely to see you, our past president. And Florence obviously is there and so many of you. So if there are no more questions, Margaret, lovely to see you. <laughs> if, there are no more has... if there are no more questions, any questions, by the way, or comments, Tracy? I, I just had a comment. I was going to put in the chat, there is an upcoming in-person event that I wanted to draw people's attention to if they live in the uh, state of Washington. Um, I uh, told Monica that I would share this. Um, so if anyone would like to come in person, um, and this, I just sent a link for the registration page. Um, and in general, we're trying to do more in-person events um, now that the world is reopening. So do stay tuned. We will have more in-person events besides this one if you are um, not in, um, aren't fortunate enough to live near where this is going to be happening. So. Good, good, good. Yeah, Jude, that's at my library with the um, William Morris Society and the Book Club of Washington, which is a member of the FABS group and a group of collectors. We're going to have printing on our hand press, a view of 
Kelmscott Books and Contemporary Books. Um, we're also featuring an exhibit called Scripts, Scribes, and Scribbles, which is about the art of hand lettering. Uh, so there's a lot going on in one day. I realize we're in the corner, far away from many of you, but hopefully we'll we'll draw some new members as well. Right. Good, good. And Jane, Jane is in the other corner from where I am. I'm in Boston, <laughs> so so I can I can I can walk to the Atlantic from here, and where Jane is, she can walk to the Pacific. And I want to thank um, the Moore Society for putting out that very nice, very frequent newsletter because it's really nice to get advance notice of all the different things that we might might join with the very convenient links. Thank you, Florence. And thank you, Sarah, for again, a delightful talk. Uh, I can hardly wait to visit the site. Yes. And again, thanks again. And we will see. We look for the next meeting. We are going to have a business meeting where we can get to vote in new members, board members, and thank outgoing members. So enjoy the rest of the uh, late winter, perhaps early sign of spring, and take good care of yourselves. <laughs>